tell us about yourself and how you got into this field? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been a naturopath for 10 years and then went back and did some more study and finished a health science degree in nutritional medicine. Um, I think I got into this out of my own experience of chronic health issues when I was a teenager and that really led me to looking at more holistic approaches to health and also things that were a bit more gent gentle on the body as well, so more natural approaches mm -hmm. and I love it. It's always interesting to me that, you know, it does start with a, an experience. You know, people in this field have had a, some sort of health issue that sparked their interest. And it makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. It yeah. starts sort of organically and you're naturally, genuinely interested in it. You know, you don't. a lot of people don't just choose it just for, oh, something to do. You've got that genuine connection with it. Like you're trying to heal yourself in, in some sort of way, health-wise. Yes, definitely. And I think a lot of naturopaths, nutritionists get into the field because of their own journey and they're searching for something that's going to help them. Mm, absolutely. So let's start with the gut because, gee whiz, the gut, uh, what was it, the, the Greek philosophers that said mm. it many years ago, obviously, um, something about that, you know, our mental health as well starts in our gut. Yeah. The good bacteria. All begins in the gut, I think is how the saying goes. Yeah. But, yeah. but specifically, I remember it really... St stuck in my mind I thought gee how interesting that they did specifically say mental sort of health issues you know like starting with anxiety depression just feeling off mm. can start in our gut so if we're eating wrong we're eating mm. lots of sugar ac acidic foods perhaps too much meat mm. not enough vegetables that that can affect how we feel psychologically and I thought that was so fascinating yeah, definitely. If you think about it, the digestive system is really the gateway to everything else in the body. And everything in our body is made up of the nutrients that we put in, the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals, all required for our body to function well. So, um, yeah, if your gut's not good, you tend to see other problems as well. Mm. And we were just having a little chat about sort of not uh, overpacking our system. I think that's sort of important to start with too because... Mm you know, we can overeat. I think that's something we should just discuss too. You know, like we were saying, you can eat a, you know, if you're eating a tuna salad, for example, that's got your protein, it's healthy, and you're having it with a whole meal toast or sandwich. But if we, if we have three serves, you know, if we just eat too much, that can be detrimental to our health. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, because we have such an abundance of food around us, it's become so con convenient in mm. the West that uh, we can grab food anytime we want to. And we're also living these modern lives which are so busy and so packed full of everything that we've lost touch with um, what our body's telling us. So we've lost touch with what a hunger cue feels like or um, you know, other things that, that drive us to eat when we're hungry and not eat just because we're sad or <laughs> You know, those sorts of things. That's right. Yeah, mm. um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that also to um, check in with ourselves. We've talked about that a few times with different um, people on the show. Mm. But, you know, like even I've sort of said that, you know, when I leave here and I get home at 6.30 and I might not be hungry, but I just eat the food. Mm. I eat because yeah. I think, well, at 6.30, that's what I do. I eat. And I noticed a, a few months ago that I was eating and I wasn't hungry. And I thought, well, maybe that's something. Maybe yeah. we don't need to eat, you know, to, yeah. to spark that awareness and discussion that we just like eat, like you said earlier, intuitively. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really important just to slow down and think about how we're feeling before we have a meal mm. um, or a snack. You know, is our body, does our body need nourishing or are there other reasons that we're reaching for food? Mm. And it might be that when you do become mindful of your body that you realise that oh, I'm really not that hungry very often at all. And in those circumstances, you know, that could be a problem and there could be something underlying that. And that's when you want to seek, yeah. some, seek some support. Um, or if you mm. feel that you've really lost touch and you really need some help, then that's also another time when you might want to get some support. Because I do find a lot of clients as well, they get used to feeling quite bloated or, uh, uh, and they've confused that for feelings of fullness. And it's interesting when you move people to a healthier diet, they'll start to say to you, oh, but I don't really feel like I'm quite full, but it's actually that bloated feeling that they're, they're missing. So um, it's getting back in touch with what full feels like as well. 
and stopping, you know, that a lot of cultures have this thing where you stop when you're 80% full. Mm. Um, and that's kind of a good rule to go by as well. And what, what cultures have you come across? Um, well, Japan particularly, you know, they, they have a um, saying, I don't ask me what the saying, <laughs> how it goes, but this idea that you eat till you're just satisfied or till you're 80% nice. full so that you're not over overloading yourself like you said mm. Mm. yeah and, and I think like you said as well people do get used to that feeling of bloating and if the stomach is a bit sort of flatter and we feel good and light we think you know H -h hold on I don't I think we just get used to feeling a certain way yeah and it becomes normal like used to overeating mm. or used to that bloaty feeling yeah and it's not until you stop or that your mm. body becomes in a um, moves to a healthier place that you realise, yeah, I wasn't actually feeling 100% back then. Mm. Mm. So you mentioned before uh, no appetite. So can that be a sign of something not right? It will help. Well, if you ne if you never have an appetite, yeah, definitely. That's or just um, not eating. What about not eating much? Uh, look, it's a really individual thing. Um, the amount that people need to eat in order to sustain them really varies from person to person depending on their life yeah. stage, their physical activity levels, their gender even. Um, so all of all of these things have an impact. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, it's really um, hard to say how much yeah. an individual should eat. And the general rules are very general. Mm. Um, so I suppose if someone is experiencing that they are not wanting to eat hardly anything, hardly ever, then yeah, that, that could be a problem. Yeah. Mm. So what are some of the main issues that people, you know, could you say is there a general issue or two that most people have when they come to you for health? Um, so I see quite a wide variety of different conditions in mm. clinic. Um, digestive issues is definitely up there. Um, and stress and anxiety as well. Um, I also work with um, people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, post-viral fatigue, that type of mm. thing. Um, but really it does vary yeah. a lot. Um, but definitely we are 95% of the time working on digestion, I would say, mm. in conjunction with other, other more specific things, yeah. yeah. Um, so what foods are good for anxiety? or just that, that calm the system and mind, uh, there's some general yep. sort of things? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think one of the big things is to make sure you're getting your essential fatty acids in. So mm -hmm. these are the good fats that nourish our brain um, and help dampen down inflammation. And anything that does that is gonna help reduce anxiety as well. So definitely getting your oily fish in, so your salmon, your sardines, Nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. a daily serve of nuts and seeds um, is a good option as well. That's also going to give you really good quality uh, protein and minerals, which are the building blocks of our neurotransmitters. So those brain chemicals that help to keep our mood stable. Um, nuts and seeds. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good for anxiety. Um, probably the other thing that jumps to mind is green tea. Mm. And that's okay. a really good one as well, just to um, keep the the mind calm and alert, as they say, just, and to help reduce anxiety. It's full of antioxidants and full of theanine as well, which helps helps with that action. So, what about if people don't want the caffeine part, which green tea has? Green tea has chamomile. Uh, yeah, well, chamomile is a great yeah great nervine. That's a beautiful one. Yep. What do you call it? Nervine. Yeah, so it helps to nourish the nervous system. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Chamomile. Yep, great, great one for digestion as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good. Um, and turmeric would be another one as well. So, um, I mean, you can get turmeric tea now, but just adding it in your cooking uh, wherever you can um, is a great um, spice for mood. Really? Yeah, yep. There's a lot of studies on turmeric now and its antidepressant effect, effects and anti inflammatory effects. Mm. Interesting. Um, so, nuts and seeds, you said, but I just wrote mm. down flax to remind myself. So, flax is flax seeds because you know it becomes sort of gelatin, sort of thick ish. Yeah. Is that like a good thing too to help with um, 
digestion. Elimination and things like that. Yeah, sure. Well, anything that's rich in fiber is going to be great for digestive health yeah. and for elimination. Um, but flax seeds also are a really great source of omega-3. Mm. So um, they're great for digestion and great for mental health. Right. And I also ask about that because, you know, for vegans and vegetarians that don't eat mm, fish yep. to get their, you know, fatty acids, does that come from flax? And Yes, definitely. Right. Yep. So flax, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, great source of omega-3. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, chia seeds are nice, aren't they? Yeah, they're great. Make a nice chia pudding. They're sort of crunchy to start with, but then they get a bit thick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it depends what you're using them for, mm. for but they do make a really nice pudding. Um, mm. which is quite easy to do. Nice to make a healthy healthy chia jam. It's a nice way to eat them yeah. as well. How do you do that? Yeah. With what? Um, so the chia seeds, well, I'd, I usually use like mixed berries, either fresh or frozen. Um, nice. Yeah, and you just blend them up and because they are that gelatinous um, texture, they hold it all together and make it into a jam consistency and you can use that. Do you add sugar and things? Uh, I might add like a, a splash of maple syrup, mm. um, but it depends how sweet your berries are. So yeah, yeah I, li I like that. I don't like adding too much sugar in jams yeah, and things because no. you think, well, all those good berries and everything good in it and then you're going to destroy it with all the sugar. Yeah. I mean, it's all right if you have a little bit, but if you want a good lathering Slatter. on your toast, yep. you, you, you don't feel guilty if it's yeah. just like the way you do it, yeah, the that's berries right. and chia. Yeah, yep. So is that all you put in? Berries, chia yep. and maple syrup? Yeah. Yep. That's all I put in. Nice. Yeah, it's Very beautiful. Good. Mm. Um, and other collagen producing foods? Um, yeah, so uh, collagen obviously is required for your skin and your hair and nails. Um, it's also really good for the healing of the gut lining as well. So yeah. we ma our bodies make collagen from the amino acids that come from the proteins that we eat. So all, all proteins, so whether it's your vegetarian proteins, your nuts, your seeds, your tofu, those types of things, mm. or whether it's your, your meat and chicken, mm. etc. cetera. Um, it's, yeah, you need those amino acids to make the collagen, and then you also need your nutrients. So zinc and vitamin C are probably the two key nutrients there. Mm -hmm. So lots of fruit and veggies and yeah. zinc-rich foods. So zinc rich foods and I know when I think of zinc I think we all think of uh, we've heard of oysters oysters uh, yeah if we don't you know eat seafood what, what's yeah good? it's a bit of an acquired taste isn't it mm. um, oh, I like them yeah so do I actually cool. uh, not everyone cool. does Patrick, is it? yeah I haven't had them yep. in a while yep. How yeah do you yeah no oysters, oysters are great um yeah Kilpatrick's good or just with a bit of lemon yeah yeah yep um oysters are fantastic seafood in general is a good source of zinc mm. um okay and um, meat and um, yeah, animal foods are a good source of zinc. Otherwise, pepitas. Pepitas mm. are good, mm, probably. For zinc? Yeah, for zinc. And cashews pumpkin have seeds. a fair bit of zinc as well. Yeah, uh, pumpkin seeds, yeah. yeah. And cashews, yeah. okay. Good to know. Yeah. Um, and when you get sort of people that want to sort of stay more away from animal products, are there certain things that you recommend you sort of say have supplements or vitamin supplements or just up more uptake in certain fruits and veggies or grains? Yeah, so um, um, some, sometimes they will need supplements yeah. regardless of how well they're doing with their diet. Uh, but we always try and work with the foods that they're eating first. Yeah. Um, and then monitor those nutrients, particularly B12 and iron, through their blood tests. Um, but there are some ways that you can increase the absorption, particularly with iron, mm. because the vegetarian sources are a lot harder for our bodies to break down and absorb. So um, with iron, um, so things like cashews, for example, and chia seeds, they do have some iron in them. Um, so eating those with something that's rich in vitamin C, or that has an acidity to it, so like lemon and lime juice, those types of things, can help with the breakdown and the absorption of the iron as well. So we try and do mm. those combinations so that they can get the most out of their vegetarian sources. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, but, and we were just having a chat before we started and you are mentioning about the Mediterranean diet and you sort of like that, if you could just share a bit of your 
yeah. concepts and ideas on that. Yeah. So um, obviously I'm working individually with people, so um, there's no one diet that fits all. Mm. But I do think as a general rule, the Mediterranean diet gives a good guide. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Mediterranean diet, it includes sort of a limited red meat, um, lots of oily fish, lots of olive oil, lots of nuts and seeds, and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, mm. I think would be the main, um, the main aspects of the diet. And they really, there's been so much research um, go, go into it in terms of general health, metabolic health, mental health, um, weight management, all of those um, different areas. It gives you lots of omega-3s, lots of the healthy fats, lots of the fibre that we talked about, the minerals, and it limits some of those more inflammatory foods. So things like the red meat, um, it limits dairy. Uh, it doesn't eliminate dairy, but it recommends sort of smaller amounts of fermented dairy. So you know, a little bit of yogurt and that type of thing. Um, so yeah, if I was going to make a general uh, recommendation, that yeah. would be something I would I would lean towards. Yeah. Yeah. Righty -o. Um, So when you said fermented dairy, so mm. namely yogurt, so is that really minimal cheese then? Yogurt and a bit of cheese. Cheese is fermented as well. So yeah, um, yeah little bits of cheese and dairy. They just tend to be a little bit easier to digest when mm -hmm. they're in those forms. And also they're giving you those probiotics as well, which is going to benefit yeah. your digestion and your gut health. Okay. Um, what about herbal teas? Are you, any sort of uh, good tips there? What's a good generic one to have? Or yeah, like yeah. Um, so I love um, licorice and cinnamon, you know, particularly if people are having blood sugar issues, uh, weight management, that type of thing. Um, do caution with licorice if you've got high blood pressure. Just talk to your doctor or naturopath about that first. It ri rises, makes um, the blood pressure go up, does it? Yeah, if you have too much, it can um, be have a negative effect towards that. Um, but if your blood pressure is normal, it shouldn't, yeah. it's not an issue. Is um, that like the aniseed? Yeah, it so the licorice root right tea. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the glycerin, I think, in it um, causes that reaction to, hap mm. to happen um, but it's a great medicinal herbal tea um, for, for the blood sugar and for stress as well so if you're feeling stressed it's a great one to be drinking Licorice. and it really has that natural sweetness to it as well it does, so if it? you get those sugar cravings it can be a nice substitute and have the tea first and then see if the craving passes yeah um, yeah so I love those I love peppermint peppermint and chamomile are great for digestion mm. as well if you're feeling a bit upset in the stomach um, Mix them together. Oh, not necessarily. No, yeah. you can have either or. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know how they'd be mixed together, but <laughs> probably okay. Yeah. Because peppermint's quite cooling, isn't it? Like, yeah. It sort of makes sense to mix the chamomile peppermint. I, I don't know. Yeah. I think because it, the calming of the chamomile and the peppermint's sometimes a bit harsh. It's a bit cooling. I suppose it depends on the person. It does depend on the person, and this is the thing. It all comes yeah. down to the individual, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think most people are, are good with peppermint yeah. tea. Um, yeah, and of course your green teas and white tea is probably my favourite. Yeah, so white tea. That's right. Yeah, as in the... Um, That's got caffeine, hasn't it, in it? It has a small amount of caffeine. So if you're looking yeah. at the different teas with your white tea, green tea and black tea, so they're all the same plant but picked mm. at different stages. That's right. And processed differently. So the white tea has a higher level of antioxidants and a smaller amount of caffeine. Was that the younger plant? The that's white the tea? younger plant. Right. Yeah, yeah. And what what did you say about the caffeine with that? So it had less caffeine yes. than a green tea gotcha. or a black tea. Yeah. And do you think the taste of the white tea is different? I think it's milder. It's kind mm. of it's smooth and it's got like a really subtle sweetness to it. Um, I, I it's just my favourite at the moment. Yeah. So and because I don't like to have too much caffeine. Um, but a little bit's okay, so it works well for me. Yeah, mm. because green tea can be a bit bitter. You know, it can it leaves, be. It, what does it leave on the tongue? Some yeah, is that taste. tanniny? Is it tanniny? Are yeah. the tannins that cause that sort of yeah astringent taste astringent. from the tongue? Yeah, but, but that's good though, isn't it? The astringent for the body. Oh uh, yeah, it can. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, yeah. 
again, depends on the person. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. All right. Yeah. So just curious, do, do you drink coffee? Because you said you limit your caffeine. Do you drink coffee? I do drink coffee. Yeah. Um, I probably have two or three a week. Oh, okay. Yeah, I enjoy, I do enjoy a coffee. Um, and as far, you know, one coffee a day is fine for most people. Perhaps if you've got anxiety or if there's severe des digestive issues or other things going on in the body, then you might recommend against it. Um, but for most healthy people, one coffee a day should be okay. It's more the sugar and the milk we put in it that's mm. probably more of the issue. But So can caffeine make people anxious? It can heighten that. It can heighten that response, yeah. That's if they're already predisposed to anxiety. Yes. But it can't make just... Yeah someone anxious? Uh, well, it shouldn't unless no, they're shouldn't. having very large amounts. Yeah. If it's ha they're having very large yeah. amounts, then it could. <laughs> yeah, I mean a sort of a mild anxious sort of feeling where we don't really notice. You know, we feel a bit sort of uh, hyped up after yeah. coffee. Is that, is that anxious or is that raring to go? I don't know. It's different for everyone. But you hear people say different things. Yeah, yeah. Different people yeah. experience it differently. And again, it's that being aware of how your body is feeling and what mm -hmm. your body's telling you after you've had yeah. that drink. Yeah. And, and coffee is demonised a lot in, you know, certain uh, people, you know, health experts say not to have it. But, mm. you know, it's good to hear you say, you know, you have a couple a week, you can have yeah. one a day. Yep. But yep. having one a day, can that get people addicted? That's what I think a lot of us want to know. Because uh, we, we don't want yeah. those headaches, you know, those headaches when we miss headaches? one. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I have this conversation with my husband quite a bit. <laughs> Um, why, it can be so? addictive. He loves his coffee. Yeah, it well, can how many be. How many is he on a day? Oh, he, he usually just have one, but sometimes more. But he will get the headache if if he goes uh, if he misses, misses a day. Um, so it, yeah, it can have that addictive nature to it. Yeah. But it again depends on the person. Not everyone will respond in that way. And not everyone is mindful enough to recognise that they're having that reaction mm. if they uh, miss true. a day or if they you know, don't have their morning coffee or whatever. Mm. Um, but if you get to the point, I always say to clients, if you get to the point where you feel like you need a coffee as opposed to wanting a coffee, then that could be a problem. And maybe it's good to take a little break and, That's a good point. and um, wean yourself off it and then come back to it later. The, the, that's the thing though, look I haven't had coffee for a few weeks but the reason why I stopped is because I was only having one coffee a day, it wasn't strong, Yep. but I missed the coffee because I didn't want the coffee that day obviously, but I had the worst headache that night and I, I said to myself, I thought, well I don't want to be this addicted because it wasn't a good headache, it wasn't just a headache, it was literally like a migraine, Yeah. You know. Yeah. and then when I have some coffee it goes and I thought, okay now my body is addicted yes and I yeah. sort of googled what happens to the brain and something happens with the you know where the blood flows through our brain and so coffee really can be addictive and that put me off I thought let me just do a little mm. experiment for a week or two because I've heard a lot of health people say and mm. um, naturopaths and Ayurvedic doctors say we hear all this advice but let's be our own sort of let's do an, uh, an experiment for a week or two. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it's not gonna do you any we don't harm, know. is it? <laughs> exactly, yeah, so. because we hear so many things, so let's mm. just use our body as a little experiment, say, so, okay, let me try this or that for a week or two, see mm. how we feel. If we feel good, great. If we don't, okay, we can go back to that. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I would say about that, though, is to be cautious, because um, particularly with things like sugar or any kind of major dietary change, you can have some symptoms of withdrawal, I guess, or maybe a better way of saying it is it takes time for your body to adapt. Yeah. And so you can feel quite unwell for a little while, particularly with sugar. It can take a few weeks to really for your body to get back to its balance, I suppose. Really? Yeah, but also I would say with that, if you're making major dietary changes like that, it is good to talk to your nutritionist or naturopath just to make sure that you're yeah. doing it in a way that's healthy for you. Good point. Mm. Good point. Very good. <laughs> you, you know, because I do hear people saying, you know, we've, we've cut out sugar. That's a big one, isn't it? People yeah. do that. It's like no sugar. But is it, I think, well, isn't it good to just slowly eliminate it? Yeah. Because, yeah, you would get headaches or, or what, feel sick or yeah. if you just go cold yeah, turkey. Yeah, you could feel just really lethargic, Tired, yeah. get the headaches. Um, 
you might feel like you don't sleep as well for a little while. Like everyone's bodies react a little bit differently. Mm. Um, yeah. But if you, you notice that, your body's probably making some major adjustments there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, another good point you make, that's good. Mm. Because I think a lot of people like to be their own doctor, but we have to do it carefully. We have to go That's see right. people like yourself, naturopaths, to yeah. say, hey, you know, you might think it's a good thing cutting yeah. out coffee or sugar or dairy, but mm. maybe do it this way. Yeah, that's right. This is where we come that's to you right. and you guide us. And this is our plan. job. Like, this is what we're trained for, exactly. to guide you through um, making the best changes for you and mm. to have someone actually assess your health and not just Dr. Google um, exactly. and self-prescribing and all that. Um, yeah, true. Yeah, get some advice. So, do you uh, get people to have a blood test as well? Um, it depends on the case. Some people, by the time they've come to me, they've already had a lot of blood tests, oh. um, and I might have a look at those. Um, but if I think there is something that has come up in our case taking that right. warrants a blood test, then I will. Um, ask them to go and get some bloods done definitely okay all right and just before we finish off one or two more things what about with sleep what's some good sleep uh, I know so teas or do we have hot milk you, you know hear people mm. saying have a little hot milk at bed bedtime yeah yeah us. well there's um, um there is substances in milk which is supposed to help with inducing sleep but definitely the herbal teas are a good one. So the chamomile is a great idea. Yeah. And just good sleep hygiene, like have a routine. We always, we're so big on routines for babies and little kids, but actually adults work really well with bedtime routines as well. So, um, you know, whether it's incorporating a bath, whether you are reading a book, and whether you're doing a meditation, um, yeah. you know, anything that sort of helps get your body and your mind thinking, okay, it's time for bed now mm. and helping you to wind down so that you can get that quality sleep in, really, really important. Mm. But definitely, yeah, the herbal teas are great. So lavender is a good one. Lavender tea. tea. Lavender as a tea or as an essential oil, oh, you okay. can um, uh, burn it or put a little bit on a tissue next to your bed. Um, that yeah. can be a good thing for some people as well. Because a lot of people don't sleep well, We're, you know, it's, it's so common, isn't it? It's really common and I think it's a really difficult thing to combat because we're so immersed in technology and screens mm. now that that's a big issue as well, that people are on their computers or phones right up until they mm. turn out the light. Yeah. And that actually has a big impact on our brain and its ability to produce melatonin and mm. those sleep cues that we naturally get or are supposed to get. Um, yeah. They just don't work when we've got screens all day, every day. Yeah. yeah. And we want to switch off before we sleep too because, you know, you hear people saying as well, they have bad dreams or, you know, I was even scrolling through Facebook, uh, a few different groups yesterday. I'm a, a part of a few different health and wellness groups and uh, someone was talking about lucid dreaming and someone mm -hmm. said, how can I not have um, bad dreams? And, and someone said, do lucid dreaming. and. Um, before you sleep just become very calm yeah tell yourself some very positive things like i'm in control i've got this you know i can get through everything negative and really put some positive aff affirmations in their mind and then they can visualize what they want to do in their dream like even sort of say okay when i dream i want to look at my left hand or something it's like yeah. controlling the dream okay and that's, that's another really field yeah, in itself sounds, yeah. but I, and then i stopped because I don't know why, but I, I stopped reading it for some reason, had to do something or whatever. But I thought, gee, that's interesting to delve into too. Yeah. Because dreams can affect our sleep. You know, we might be ready for sleep or go to bed early, but then mm. dreams, negative dreams can wake someone up and they're not feeling so great. Yeah, definitely. That's true. So is there anything else uh, we need to share before we finish off and also uh, how we can contact you, things like that? Yeah, um, well, you can definitely contact me. Probably the easiest way is um, going to my website, which is kellyk.com.au, and it's Kelly with an I, um, <laughs> which gets a bit frustrating, but it's all right. So Kelly, my niece is Kelly with an I. Oh, is she? Nice. Yeah. Oh, excellent. kellyk.com.au. Um, and from there, you can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. 
um, you can search my name or Kelly K Health, I should come up as well. And I'm always posting the information and recipes and different things on there as well. So I'd love yeah. it if people wanted to follow me on there. Um, and yeah, there is booking online. So if people are, are actually interested in consultations, yeah. um, there is online booking, or you can also find my contact details from my website as well. Okay. Um, now, I've just got a point in front of me. We were going to discuss food combinations. We didn't do that, and, and that's okay. But, you know, we were just saying things like, you know, heavy foods not going together, you know, very heavy foods, meat and dairy and things like that. But that, yeah. that's a whole other area. Um, yeah, so food combining is something that's kind of gone in and out of fashion a little bit. Um, and it is based on more Ayurvedic principles that certain foods don't go together because they require different enzymes mm. um, and a different environment to digest properly. Uh, my, I suppose from my point of view and my perspective, um, or from a scientific perspective, I don't think there's been much research into that. Um, okay. That's not really? to say that it. Yeah. That's not to say that it may not be beneficial. It's mm. just that no one's taken the time and money to um, yeah. see if it's helpful. Um, so I guess from my point of view, if um, if someone has a good, healthy, robust digestion, mm. then there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to have a variety of combinations together because our bodies do release all those enzymes yeah. um, together in one one go when we eat. Um, so that's from my Western naturopathic perspective, mm. but an Ayurvedic practitioner might have a different idea about that as well. So, All right. Mm. Thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Very good. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Cheers. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank I've you. got it all in. That's awesome. Yeah, that's excellent. I hope that was, it was what you were looking for. That was good. Thank you. Uh, so, do you want to say goodbye here? Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. <laughs>